All right, so in this video, we talk about the like operator. It's a completely new operator that we've never seen before, but we also learn about something called patterns, which is sort of like string comparison, but a lot cooler. So let me get into what exactly I mean by that. Uh, we will be covering 7.10 in the focus on the concept section. So the like operator actually lets you determine whether a string matches a certain pattern of strings. So string equality tests to see if the string on the left is exactly equal to the string on the right. But the like operator actually lets you see if the string on the left falls into a certain pattern of strings. And I'll try to explain more about what I mean by patterns as we go along through this. Uh, but the syntax of it is you have your testing string, the string that you're trying to see if it matches the pattern on the left side. And then you type like with a capital L and then the pattern string on the right. And the pattern string is a very special string that uses very special characters that if it were placed anywhere else in the program would be treated as a regular string. But when it's placed on the right side of a like operator, uh, this pattern string and specifically the special characters in the pattern string are treated completely differently. So it's a really cool way of going about it. And then this whole thing, the like operator and the two operands on each side, uh, this all evaluates to a Boolean value. So either it's true that the test string is like the pattern string, or it's false that the test string is like the pattern string. And then the pattern itself, it's just a whole bunch of special symbols, it defines a set of possible strings. You can think of it as you define a grouping of every single possible string such that if your test string matches one of those strings in this whole group of possible strings, it evaluates to true. You can also think of it as defining a set of rules that your test string has to follow in order to actually fit into this pattern, fit into this group. That's probably the more accurate way to think about it, but it's more than just one string. It's defining a whole set of strings that you're comparing against, and you have to match against at least one of them. So yeah, the equality operator lets you compare exactly one string. So I can check if a particular string is the string containing blah, but the like operator would let you compare to a defined set of strings defined by this pattern. So I can check if the string is, let's say, blah, bleh, bleh, blah, or blah. You know, is the string the letters uppercase B, lowercase l, followed by exactly one vowel, but it doesn't matter what vowel it is, followed by a lowercase h. That's one example. Or I can see if the string is the letters uppercase B, lowercase l, followed by zero or more a's, followed by h. Or even I could say, is the string uppercase b, lowercase l, followed by any number of characters, followed by one h. There has to be one h at the end. That's what the second uh, sort of example is looking for, is uppercase b, lowercase l, zero or more of just any character whatsoever, it doesn't matter what it is, letters, numbers, symbols, anything, and then followed by exactly one lowercase h. So that's the kind of stuff we're looking for in terms of these types of rules here. So when we're building up our pattern string, in order to specify more than one possible uh, test string that evaluates to true for this pattern, uh, we have to use these special characters in order to define the rules of the pattern. So three of the special characters we'll be using are the question mark, the asterisk, and the pound. And they will show up in the middle of this pattern string. And I'll show some examples of what it looks like to use uh, these pattern matching characters in just a second. But when you see a question mark, and a pattern, by the way, will look maybe a little bit like a word or a phrase or a string or whatever. It will look a little bit like that but it'll have these uh, symbols interspersed in between. Um, so the symbol question mark will match any single character. It could be any character whatsoever. 
including symbols, including letters, uppercase and lowercase, including digits. You know, any of the control characters, it doesn't even matter, but it only matches one of them. Uh, an asterisk will match zero or more characters, and it could be any character, again. Uh, any combination of characters, it doesn't have to be repetition or anything like that. It could be zero or more of just anything. And then the pound sign or the hashtag or whatever you want to call it, there's multiple names, the sharp, if you're musically inclined, uh, that will match any single digit. So specifically a digit, um, not the letters, not any symbol, the digits zero through nine and exactly one of them. All right, so our first example is uh, using the question mark right here. Uh, our pattern is uppercase B, question mark, uppercase L, and uppercase L. Now the uh, expression string first, like our pattern right here, is going to be true for all strings that start with a B, uppercase, end with an LL, both uppercase, and contain exactly one character in between that uppercase B and lowercase LL. So it'll be true for, uh, in all caps, Bill. We can have uppercase B, lowercase A, uppercase L, uppercase L, because you know the question mark character doesn't actually have to be an uppercase letter. It's just the B and the two Ls that flank the um, question mark character right there that have to be uppercase. But the character in between can be anything. It can be a lowercase a, an uppercase i, the number three, a space, uh, an uppercase z, a tab, a new line, anything you want. Um, it will hold true. However, it will be false if you don't have any characters between the left and the right side of that string. So between that uppercase b and then the two uppercase l's. So b l l that does not match our pattern right here. Uh, Bill with an uppercase B and everything else lowercase also does not match the pattern because the L's are lowercase. Uh, Billy with a Y at the end does not match because the pattern does not say that you're allowed to have a Y at the end. It says that the string has to end with LL, so no Y's afterwards. Nothing before or after what's specified in the pattern, it has to be exactly what's specified in the pattern. Uh, simil similarly, you can have two characters in between, although the lowercase b and the lower lowercase l's also kind of disqualify it, but the two a's also would, because you can only have one character between the b and the l's. Uh, if you're missing an l, like in bill with only one l, that would be disqualification. The word apple very much disqualifies, or is disqualified, because there's not even the uppercase B, not to mention all the other rules that are broken. One, two, three, four, five is disqualified for similar reasons, and so on and so forth. So that's an example of using the question mark like that. Now what we can do is actually combine this with the two upper method, which, you know, we take string first, we make everything uppercase, and then we try to match it to this same pattern that we just looked at. And this actually gives us a lot more freedom because now string first is allowed to start with lowercase b or uppercase b because we convert it to uppercase before the like operator compares it to the pattern. Uh, it can end with any combination of two L's. So uh, both uppercase, both lowercase, lowercase, uppercase, uppercase, lowercase, any of those are fine. And it still contains exactly one character in between. So if string first is, um, you know, bill with an only an uppercase b, uh, all caps ball, lowercase b, three, uh, uppercase l, lowercase l, you know, all of these, right, where as long as you have the b in any case, two l's in any combination of cases, and exactly one character in between, it totally works. Uh, to upper converts it to all uppercase so that they all will get matched by our pattern matching character, even though the pattern matching character is exactly the same. So that is an option for you. 
and it's going to be false for um, all, of, all of these strings for any of the non-capitalization related reasons that I had talked about before, like not having a character between the B's and the L's, or having extra characters, or um, not having enough of the required characters, or just not looking like this at all, right? So that is an example of how we can actually use the string methods like this to give us a little bit more flexibility when it comes to matching patterns like this. Another example is um, when we use the asterisk to specify zero or more characters. So for example, um, text state dot text like uh, the pattern uppercase K and then a star or an asterisk. Uh, it has to start with an uppercase K, no lowercase, and then there are zero or more characters after. So it's going to be true for just the letter K, for Kansas, for KS, the abbreviation of Kansas, uh, uppercase K, lowercase s, or uppercase K and uppercase s. Uh, you can do Krampus, Koala Sanctuary, uh, all of those will match just fine. Uh, it will be false, however, for anything that doesn't start with an uppercase K. So lowercase k, lowercase ks, uh, lowercase k, Kansas, um, all that kind of stuff. And of course, we could do the same uh, dot upper to upper thing that we did before in order to convert everything to all uppercase and allow us to match even more possible strings. But something that this would actually work really well with is if we had the users select their state from a dropdown menu or you know a list box or something like that i uh, i say drop down menu a combo box my bad um so that we know that whatever input they're choosing has to be a valid state then we know for sure that if we use this pattern matching to then match it with all strings starting with an uppercase k we know for sure that they have a state starting with an uppercase K like Kansas or Kentucky and so on and so forth. Uh, the nice thing about doing that is we're controlling the user's input so that we know they're putting in Kansas and not, or you know, Kansas or Kentucky or something and not putting in something like Krampus or Koala Sanctuary. Or we could do that with the abbreviations as well. But if we're controlling the user input like that, then using the like operator like this is really helpful because then it makes it really easy for us to know this is a state that we're look that we're going to get out of it. This that starts with K, and not something weird that starts with an uppercase K. Unlike if we gave them a text box where they might input something random that may or may not be a state. So that's really helpful. Uh, a really helpful thing we can do. All right. So here's another example. Uh, string ID like uh, pound 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 asterisk. The string containing that. This is going to match for exactly three digits because the pound sign matches for exactly one digit and then we have three of them next to each other. Uh, so that's three digits. They can be any digit. And then it will be followed by zero or more characters. So uh, this whole thing will be true for the number 178 or 983 AB or 1 800 are you slapping where there is no dash between the one and the eight. Uh, any string that looks like that, where there are three consecutive digits at the very beginning and then anything else, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if there's nothing afterwards, but as long as there are three consecutive digits at the very beginning, that's all that matters. Uh, it will be false for something like uh, one dash 800 dash are you slapping? It will be false for the number 27, and it will be false for 1ABABA, because all three of those do not uh, start with three digits right next to each other. Now, suppose you have your standard ID system for whatever company you're working for, right? The IDs are always exactly three digits followed by three more characters, but those characters could be anything. Well, if you're trying to validate that an ID number looks correct, 
using this expression by itself isn't going to work because the um, ID is going to match anything that starts with three numbers. Or my apologies, not the ID. The pattern is going to match anything that starts with three numbers and then has zero or more characters after. But you're looking for only IDs with three numbers and then three additional characters after, and it doesn't matter what they are. So there have to be exactly six characters no matter what, and three of them have to be um, numbers. Well, what you can do is you can filter out first all the strings that are not six characters in length. So all the ones that are too short and all the ones that are too long. And that would give you, uh, you know, that would get rid of maybe 99% of the possible bad input or of the possible input that you would get because you're filtering out all these possible bad values like that. So you first check if the, um, the string is exactly six characters in length. So you do string ID dot length equals six, filter out all the bad values. If they, if it's not six characters, then why even bother checking if it matches the pattern, right? And then once you're good with that, you know, you can put an and also string ID like the pattern pound, 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 asterisk. So you filter out everything that's a bad length. If it's less than six, if it's greater than six, you uh, completely just switch the whole thing to false because, um, you know, you can use an and also to do some short circuit evaluation and kind of make everything work real nicely that way. And then in the case that it is exactly six characters, then you can check if it's like the pattern. And the pattern would match for any length of string so long as it started with the three numbers, but you know already that it's going to be six characters because of the and also. If you're already checking the pattern, then you already know you have a valid length. So then if it's the right length and the right pattern, you know, it matches the pattern, then you know you have a valid ID. So that's something you can do for a situation like this. Now we have a couple of other interesting um, pattern matching characters right here, which are the square brackets. So what you do is you type square brackets, and then in between the square brackets, you type a whole bunch of characters that are not separated by commas or anything. You just type the characters next to each other. And then when you do that, it will match any single character in the list of characters that you typed that are all next to each other. Um, you can also put an exclamation mark right after the opening square bracket and then type all of your characters, no commas or spaces or anything like that, unless, well, sometimes you do want to type a comma and a space if you're trying to match the character, comma or space, but supposing you're not, you type everything not separated by commas or spaces. They're just all crammed next to each other. And this uh, right here will match any character that is not contained in the list. So let's look at some examples of that. Now, suppose I want to revisit the previous example where we're looking at uh, strings that start with uppercase B and with uppercase LL and have one character in the middle, but I only wanted to have uh, a vowel in the inside. So what I can do is rather than specifying a question mark, I can actually enclose between square brackets, A, E, I, O, U. Uh, so then we get strings that start with an uppercase B contain exactly one vowel, uh, A, E, I, O, U, and end with uppercase L, L. And now this is going to be true when string bill is uh, ball or bell or bill or bowl or bull. Um, but, you know, the vowels are all lowercase and everything else is uppercase in this case. Uh, and it's going to be false for all caps ball, for all lowercase ball, all that kind of stuff. Um, I did specify here that it has to contain the lowercase value, uh, vowels, which is why you get these lowercase vowels in the true list uh, and everything in the false list. You know, it could be uppercase or lowercase vowels. 
uh, vowels. It could, of course, also be some of the invalid values that we saw before, like Billy or Ball with two A's or Apple or one, two, three, four, five or anything like that, of course. But it would also be false when the vowels are not lowercase or when the B and the LL are not uppercase. Now, what I could do as well is use a string uh, BLL dot to upper like uh, the pattern matching uppercase B and then any one of the uppercase vowels and then uppercase LL. And the nice thing about that is um, this actually gives us any combination of uh, B and then a vowel and then LL with any combination of capitalization thanks to the fact that we're using to upper like this. So string bill can be any of those combinations of capitalization as long as there's a B at the beginning, a vowel in the middle, and then two L's at the end. And then, you know, we convert it to uppercase and we check this all uppercase pattern right here. All right, so here's a little bit more of a complicated example, but what this is, is a for loop that um, essentially indexes through the entirety of a string, one character at a time. So starting at index zero, going to the last valid index, the length minus one. Um, it's going to take a character from this string at that index, uh, convert it to a string, and then make that string uppercase, and then store that in our string uh, char variable. So it's a string containing the character uppercased at that position. Um, and then what we can do is say if string char is like the pattern of, um, you know, any uppercase letter excluded. So it's any character as long as that character is not an uppercase letter. That's what this pattern is saying right here. You know, we have the uppercase A through Z. That's what this dash also is, by the way. This says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc., etc., X, Y, Z. When we put that dash there. So it's every letter starting at A and then going to Z. But then we put the exclamation mark before it at the very beginning, you know, between the left opening bracket and the first character that we are trying to exclude that says that we are trying to exclude this entire list of characters from this particular position of the pattern. So this whole if statement is basically saying if the character is not an uppercase letter. Now because we made this character uppercase using to upper, that means that we're essentially testing to see if the character at this index is either a lowercase or uppercase letter. We're essentially testing is the uppercase version of this character here a letter? Is it lowercase or uppercase? And if the uppercase version of this character, if string char is not a letter, then it must be a non-letter. It must be a symbol or a number or whatever. So we increment our non-letter counter by one. That's what this for loop is doing. But what I'm doing down here is I'm focusing on this if statement and giving some example strings, some example values that string char might have that would satisfy this pattern. So the string containing one, the string containing a space, the string containing an exclamation mark, the string containing an underscore, and so on and so on. It would be false for any letter, uppercase A, lowercase b, or it wouldn't be lowercase b, my apologies, string char would be uppercase b. But the pattern itself would be also true for a lowercase letter. The pattern itself. We're just guaranteeing that we will never see a lowercase letter here by construction of string char, by making it uppercase using dot to upper. So the pattern itself only excludes uppercase letters, but we are never testing lowercase letters. So it will never be true for a lowercase letter because we're 
never giving it a lowercase letter to be true for, if that makes sense. Um, theoretically, it would, it would allow lowercase letters, symbols, and digits, um, and all the other, you know, miscellaneous control characters, all that kind of stuff. Theoretically, the pattern would allow that, but it's never going to get the chance to because of how we use two upper right here. So we're using two upper to specify that we don't want lowercase and uppercase letters, even though we just specified that we don't want the uppercase letters. It's a nice little shortcut that we can use. Um, so that's what that's doing. The pattern would also be uh, false for the empty string, and it would be false for any strings that are length two or greater, of course, but we're also not coming across that by construction because string char is going to be uh, only one character at a time by the way we construct it since we are indexing in to each character individually and then setting the character to that character to this sorry setting string char equal to this individual character turned into a string so we can don't even have to worry about any of those other cases like that just based on what we are implicitly restricting string char from being you know the possibilities that we're restricting string char from being by construction of this, uh, what string char is. Now, here are some other interesting um, header matching things we can use. We can use our square brackets to specify multiple ranges of characters. For example, we can do the characters lowercase a through z and uppercase a through z, like this, lowercase a dash z, uppercase a dash uppercase z. Uh, which will match all alphabetic characters. And it's really helpful for if we can't use to upper or to lower for whatever reason. For example, if we need to preserve the capital, the exact capitalization of other parts of the string, but we still want to match any alphabetic character for this particular slot in the pattern. And this is also... Uh, valid for when we use the exclusion version of this if we put an exclamation mark in between the left bracket and the lowercase a that would exclude all of the alphabetic characters it would match anything that's not an alphabetic character so sort of like this is what we could use it to explicitly get rid of all the alphabetic characters in the last example if we didn't use two upper to guarantee that we were getting rid of all the lowercase and uppercase values like that. So this is a really helpful version if you can't use to upper or to lower. If you have to preserve uppercase and lowercase uh, capitalization throughout other parts of the string that you're trying to test, it's really helpful. Now, what if you only wanted to match numbers or letters? You wanted one particular character to be a number or a letter, you didn't want it to be a symbol. Or what if you wanted to get rid of all the numbers and letters and only let that particular character be a symbol? Well, we have to get a little bit creative with how we specify our allowed or disallowed values. So we could try, you know, putting a pound sign in front of our pattern that matches all letters to try to say, I want it to be a number or I want it to be letters, but something like this is going to match one number followed by one letter. So when you put them together like this, right next to each other, it's going to say, all right, the user wants me to match one number and then it wants me to match one letter. So it has to be something like 2B or 9S or 3A or whatever. So that's not going to work. If we want one character that is a number or letter, this isn't going to work. This is two characters, which are exactly one number followed by one letter. So we have to try something else. Now, something like this, where we have a-z lowercase, and then a-z uppercase, and then the pound sign, all of that inside of our square brackets, well, that's going to match either one letter or the pound sign. So it'll match uppercase A or the pound sign or lowercase y, and it will exclude numbers. It does not match numbers at all. So the pound sign doesn't actually work inside of these square brackets the same way as it does 
outside of the square brackets. It's going to include specifically the character, the pound sign, inside of this square bracket, whereas outside of the uh, square brackets, it matches exactly one number. So that doesn't work either. So this means we have to actually specify all of the numbers as well as all of the letters inside of our square brackets. So we do our alphabetic uh, characters trick, a dash z lowercase, a dash z uppercase, and then we follow it with zero dash nine. And that will match a, a string that is exactly one letter or exactly one digit. Or if you put it inside of a larger pattern, it will match any string that in that position contains exactly one letter or one digit. So uppercase A, lowercase y, the number three, the number zero, anything like that. And it will exclude all of our symbols. Underscore, dash, exclamation mark, space, tab, anything like that, which is really helpful. And then if you want to only look at the symbols and control characters and whatever, and you want to exclude the alphabet and number, characters, you can just put an exclamation mark in front of the lowercase a, and you've suddenly exclude all those characters. It's super helpful. So yeah, it, it's a really great way of matching all these possible characters, anything that you possibly want. And you don't have to do the ranges just like this. We saw that example where I specified A, E, I, O, U right next to each other. You can just type any character you want all next to each other, and it works just fine. All right, so here's just a simple application that uh, demonstrates how you can use the uh, pattern matching in uh, Visual Basic. So all this is, is you enter a five character number and then it will, uh, you know, put it into the inventory. But you can't just enter any five character, you know, they say number or anything like that. You can't enter any five character ID for this particular inventory. You specifically have to enter, we can see the uh, like uh, pattern right there, three letters. It doesn't matter if they're uppercase or not because we have this two upper method call right there, but three letters and then two digits. That's what the, uh, the two pound signs there are referring to. So if I type in ABC12, I can add it to the list just fine. Um, if I do x, y, z, uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, uh, zero, zero, that gets added to the list just fine. Notice that it is all uppercase when it gets added to the list. Um, however, if I type in a, b, c, d, e, it's going to give me this warning, incorrect inventory number. Uh, and then I can type in, let's say one, two, three, four, five, incorrect inventory number, um, A, B, C, one, two, three, which is one too many digits. It will give me another error for inventory number being incorrect. So that's just an example of how this whole um, like thing is working, which I think is pretty neat. Okay, so suppose I wanted to give the user a little bit more feedback in terms of this error message right here, because this just says inventory, incorrect inventory number, but it doesn't say what about the inventory number was incorrect. So let's uh, comment this out real quick, because I want to show off another way of approaching this problem. Suppose I want to at least say whether they typed in too many or too few characters, and then after that, if they have type in, typed in the right number of characters, but the formatting is wrong, then tell them what the correct formatting should be. Well, what I can do is in my if statement, I can say first, if I'm, I'm going to sort of do a filter right here. So first I'm going to filter out all the strings with the incorrect length. So str number dot length is not equal to six, or my apologies, five. Uh, because it needs to be three letters and two digits exactly. So if string number is not equal to five, there we go. If string number is not equal to five, then I'm going to show them a message and I'll copy this one right here. Say, uh,
fix the tabbing. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, so now what I'll do, instead of saying incorrect inventory number, uh, inventory number must be five characters. If you wanted to go even further, you could say inventory number too short, inventory number too long, or whatever, but uh, I'm just going to leave it at inventory number must be five characters. Then, the next thing I'm going to check to see, if I'm down here, uh, else if, um, well, okay, first, I'll put this comment right here. Uh, user input is wrong size. I'll put that there because that's what we know if we are in that branch of the if statement. The next thing I'll check is to see if it violates the pattern. So if uh, else if not, sir number like a through Z, if it's A through Z, A through Z, pound, pound, then now if we are down here what we know is that we checked this condition on line 31 but the length of the string must have been five because if it wasn't five we would have displayed this message box but we're down here which means that we didn't display this message message box which means we didn't enter this branch of the if statement which means that the length is five so Length is correct, then that means we know that a uh, certain number did not match pattern. You know, we, we know that for a fact. So, what that tells us is certain number does not start with three letters or does not end with two digits or has something between them. Actually, no, it doesn't even have anything between them because uh, we know that the length of the string is five anyway. So we know that it either doesn't start with three letters. My apologies, not either, but it doesn't start with three letters or it does not end with two digits. Any other case where this pattern is not matched would result in the string being the wrong length. So, like this correct, five characters, I'll put that there as well. Now, in this case, I will use another message box. Inventory number must start with three letters and end with two digits. Even better, I can say uh, be three letters followed by two, uh, two digits. There we go. That's pretty specific for the user. So now if they're down here, they know, oh, I didn't type in three letters and then two digits. I typed in something else. Um, and they don't have to worry about length or putting stuff in between the three letters and the two digits or anything like that. They know that it just needs to be three letters, two, two digits. And then after that, type in the else statement. If we're down here in the else statement, we know that we didn't go into this branch, which means that this condition was not true. So the length is five. That's correct. We also know that we didn't go down here into this branch, which means that this condition is not true. This negation of the like. The negation is not true, which means that the statement inside is true, that this like operator evaluated to true. So string number actually completely matches this pattern. So string number matches the pattern, which also means that it is their correct length. Um, it's a little bit of a redundant check because both of these check for the um, length being equal to five. But in this case, up here, we know that the length wasn't equal to 5, so we can give this special error message. And then down here, we know that the length was equal to 5 because of up here, so we give a separate um, error message. 
Uh, actually, if we want to really tailor it, we could say something like inventory number did not start with three letters or did not end with two digits or something like that. Like you could get, get real specific with this information, but you know, that's something that we can toy with however we want. But down here, we know that the pattern was correct, which means that we can add it to the list of numbers. So that's what I will do. Uh, add to list of numbers. List numbers dot items dot add sir number just like that. And let's see if live coding like this actually works. So five character number one two or uh, ABC one two add to the list just fine. Uh, ADE12 also adds to the list just fine. Um, if I make it too long, it must be five characters. If I make it too short, it must be five characters. That's exactly what we would expect. If I do AB123, two letters and three digits, inventory number must be three letters followed by two digits. We could probably uh, workshop this message so that it all is on one line and make it look a little bit cleaner but yeah you know, it's more about making the point right here so yeah that is the power of structuring some of these if statements like this using the like operator we get all this cool feedback and we also get this really great way of uh making sure that a string is valid it's very complex and it would be such a pain to have to implement on our own so the like operator is super helpful for that. All right, so that is the video on like and patterns. Now, if you end up going into other programming languages in the future, or if you um, are familiar with other programming languages and familiar with this concept in them, uh, this, if you know, just wanting to learn more in general, really, this concept is known as a regular expression, which specifies that pattern that things can be matched against. Either some string matches the pattern that is, you know, not one specific string, but defines a set of strings. Either the string matches that or it doesn't match that. Uh, and Visual Basic keeps it pretty simple, um, as it does a lot of things. If you get into further programming, you get a lot more power behind some of these uh, regular expressions. And there are some languages that just take it to an absolute extreme with how crazy you can get. I actually use concepts like these when I'm editing my subtitles because I essentially let YouTube auto-generate the captions for me and then I run a program that essentially uses a whole bunch of these patterns in order to replace a whole bunch of very common mistakes that YouTube uses, like very common typos or grammatical errors or stuff like that. I try to automate a whole bunch of the work as much as I'm able to. And then I go through manually and actually fix any mis remaining mistakes YouTube made and then fix any of the remaining mistakes that I accidentally made because sometimes these changes can be a little bit heavy handed. But what it ends up doing is it saves me a lot of time and effort and strain on my hands, which is extremely important. And then it makes it a lot easier for me to pay more close attention to my subtitles because I'm spending so much less time. Uh, you know, less, less time on the subtitles as a whole means more time spent uh, thinking about mistakes and all that kind of stuff, you know, trying to find mistakes and all that, making sure the captions are that much more accurate. So it's a really, really powerful concept that I hope you're able to make pretty good use of. Once you, once it sort of clicks with you, once you really start understanding, you know, how this kind of thing works, you know, programming itself is a completely new way of thinking as opposed to solving other types of problems. But then regular expressions and thinking about patterns and stuff like this is an entirely new way of thinking aside from programming itself. So it's a really, really useful tool that could possibly benefit you quite a bit. It could help automate a lot of really 
annoying repetitive tasks, especially with things like repetitive data that needs to be corrected for spreadsheets or things like that. So it's super, super awesome. So I hope you get a lot of value out of this.